evening in Japan. Here is Vienna. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm very pleased and honored that I can give uh, this concluding talk in the workshop. I would have liked to come to Japan, but due to teaching duty and other reasons, I could not make it this time. But I hope to come in, in April to Japan for two weeks, and then maybe I can meet some of you. So I'm not going to talk about singularities today. Uh, I was asked to talk about moduli of uh, endpoints on the projective line. I came quite recently to this topic by Josef Schicho, also from Austria, who, who seduced me to this topic and showed me a quite uh, elementary way how to approach the theory of Delin, Mumford, and Knudsen about the moduli space of endpoints on the projective line, usually denoted by M0n and bar M0n. So as you probably know, the compactification of this space was a spectacular breakthrough in moduli theory, the proofs uh, partially very hard and difficult. And I would like to show you some of the features looking at it, at it in a more combinatorial graph theoretic way. Okay? So <clears throat> everything will be quite basic, and I hope that you can follow easily. If there are any doubts, just interrupt me, and I will try to respond. So what is our object of desire? We take an n-gon, an n-gon x equals x1 up to xn is just <clears throat> a point in the n-fold Cartesian product of the protective space. So you could take any field, but let us take uh, it over the complex numbers. So we can draw each of these xi, which are the entries of the n-gon, we can draw them in the complex plane. And I will draw them in a way so that we get a nice polygon. So you could think of such an n-gon of such a shape. Of course, you may also have points inside. Okay. So here, all the xi are pairwise different distinct, so we call it generic if and only if all xi pairwise distinct. Okay. Now, you let PGL2, the group PGL2, act on P1. So PGL2 will act on P1. I'll describe it in a moment. So let me write this as if k is our field. Here we have c. Then we can identify p1 with the field and the point at infinity. And, uh, and hence, it will also act on n-gons, on p1n. And the action is by Möbius transformations, so to define them, I will now use that the points in P1 are either finite points of the field or infinity. So you just take, how do I want to call it, Ax plus B, Cx plus D, so x goes to this fraction, and A, B, C, D will be a matrix in PGL2. So <clears throat> A, D minus B, C is non-zero. Okay. So this is, uh, as, you, as you all know, the, the group, the natural group acting on P1 by Möbius transformations. And uh, <clears throat> As you, as you look on this action, you will easily see that you can prescribe 
the picture of three points. So PG, the action is strictly three transitive. So this means that if you take three different points, let's say x1, x2, and x3, you can move them to any prescribed triple of points. And moreover, whenever you prescribe three images, there's a unique element of PGL2, PGL2 making this transformation. So this means there exists a, a unique phi in PGL2. Let us take such a generic n-gon, and then we can move phi of x into, we can move the first one to 0, the second entry to 1, then to infinity, and then we have something which we call x4 up to xn. Here we use that all the entries are pairwise distinct. So you could imagine that in your n-gon, which I have drawn here, you take three points and you move them to a special position. For instance, you don't have to take 0, 1, and infinity. You could take anything. For instance, you could arrange that your three, let me call them 0, 1, and infinity, even though this not makes, and then you continue in some sense. Way. OK? So the, the goal of the whole story is to describe the orbit space. The orbit space, which will be just, you take p1 to the n, but for the beginning, you only look at generic points, so you have to take out the big diagonal. The big diagonal are those n-gons where at least two entries are equal. And then you can <coughs> take out PGL2. And that's the orbit space of this action on this open dense subset of P1 to the n. OK? So this can be easily described because of the strict three transitivity of the action. So you see here that each orbit is completely determined by these here, by these last n minus 3 entries. So this one will be isomorphic to p1 n minus 3. You can forget about 0, 1, and infinity. And then you have to take out, again, the diagonal, because these x4 up to xn should be pairwise distinct. Okay. Now, this is kind of naive presentation. You already observe here that in this description of the orbit space, you have distinguished three entries here, the first three. So you destroyed the symmetry which acts here so does not respect symmetries given by permutations by permutations i will come back to this a little bit later and now <clears throat> Once you have this orbit space, as it is always the case in moduli problems, you want to compactify it. You want to consider limits. So the problem is determine or describe <clears throat> a, let me say, significant compactification of the orbit space 
which means uh, that we don't want to take just here p1 to the n minus 3, because this would not be significant in the sense that it is, does not preserve symmetries. So preserving symmetries and allowing universal families. So I will, at the end of my lecture, I will define what universal families are. For the moment, you don't need it. Okay. So said differently, you can formulate this problem of compactification also as a search of limits. Define limits of generic n-gons as some entries xi come together and coalesce. Okay, so many things could happen. All could become equal in the extremal case. Just two entries could become equal. So you don't control really, but you want to do it in a very systematic way. Okay. So <clears throat> first we want to define the limit, which means going to the compactification. It should be a natural concept of limit. And then we want again having PGL2 act, then study the action of PGL2 on the compactification. In front, OK. So a comment? Yes, but you have realized that my face is uh, reflected. <laughs> For those. <laughs> so this one is my right ear and not my left ear. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> I will do an example first. But before doing so, I want to talk a little bit about cross ratios. So that's, cross ratios are a miracle. So these are PGL2 invariants. And I will just define them directly. So if you have such an n gon x, and if you select i, j, k, l, you select four indices of your n-gon, then you define this as xi minus xk. You have all this, seen this in your mathematics studies, xj minus xl, and xi minus xl, xj minus xk. Now, this is easy to write down. It's a classical object, of course, and it, has, it comes from projective geometry. So if we assume here that this is generic, then this is well defined as an element in P1. But you realize that as all entries are pairwise distinct, you end up in 0 outside 0, 1, and infinity. Okay, so. The genericity of the n-gon is equivalent to the cross ratio being distinct from 0, 1, and infinity. So that's already nice. Okay. Now, uh, the cross ratio, and I don't write i, j, k, l, x is in 0, 1, and infinity, if and only if uh, 2, 
entries of xi, xj, xk, xl are equal. And you can figure out easily what entries must be equal to get cross ratio 0 or 1 or infinity. And if three entries here are, if three entries are equal, then cross is not defined because you divide 0 by 0. Okay? So it's only relevant when precisely two or two pairs of these four entries are equal. You don't allow the three come together. And this also already gives you a hint for the limits that uh, you should not have too many entries coming together. Okay. Now, as these are invariant under the PGL2 action, so let me write it down again, invariant under the PGL2 action on P1 to the n, this will, so maybe let me first write it delta minus, so on this open subset, so whenever you, so on the whole orbits, they take the same value. Easy to prove. So whenever you compactify, they will still be uh, constant on the orbits. So hence, pass over to any compactification by continuity. Okay. This will be used a little bit later on. So let me now do an example of constructing limits to show you what is a basic phenomenon. Very simple example. So we just take foregones, n equals 4 foregones. So if you look at them in C, they look like this. Okay. And now, by what I said, by the action of PGL2, I can already write x equal 0, 1, infinity. And then I want to call the last entry a. So a will be in p1 minus 0, 1, infinity. So this would be one choice of representative of the orbit. So this is a representative. of orbit, I write the orbit as bracket of x, of x. I hope you can read here, yes? So this is one representative. But we can take other ones. So for instance, we could take, uh, let me check. We could move the infinity to the last entry, one, zero, one and then something and infinity. And now you can use the cross ratios to compute the value which you get from A here. You don't get A here, but you get one minus A. Then <clears throat> still another representative would be zero, one divided by one minus A, one infinity. And the last one, I write it here, you get 1 over a, 0, 1, and infinity. So for n equals 4, you have four distinguished representatives, four representatives. So <clears throat> I will give them names. Let me call this one, as we have 0, 1, and infinity at the places 1, 2, and 3, let me call this 1, 2, 3, this one x, 1, 2, 4, this one x, 1, 3, 4, and this one x, 2, 3, 4. 
Okay. So the triples i, j, k, where we have these special values in the representative 0, 1, and infinity, they will be marked as superscripts. Okay. So now let us <clears throat> check what's going on if we pass to the limit. We let go a to one of the points 0, 1, or infinity. And for this, for this lecture, let us just take a going to infinity. So let me write this down. a going to infinity, what happens? We get, I think I, yeah, x, 1, 2, 3 will go to 0, 1, infinity, infinity. x, 1, 2, 4 will go to 0, 1. Now, 1 minus infinity is also infinity. Infinity, so we get the same thing, x, 1, 3, 4. And now something interesting happens. This goes to 0, 0, 1, infinity. And the last one, 2, 3, 4, also goes to 0, 0, 1, infinity. Now, here you have equality, but the first two are no longer PGL2 equivalent to the other two. So here, we don't have PGL2, not PGL2 equivalent. So we get two from one orbit. Yeah, this represents one orbit of an foregone. We get two different limits. Okay? And this will be a general phenomenon that when we pass to the compactification, we just Get, we will get for each orbit several limits, and we have to control how many we get. Okay. So let me write this down. So any reasonable, reasonable notion of limit will produce various limit points for a given n-gon, given generic n-gon. So that's, of course, the interesting part of the story. Okay. Now, the idea how to approach them, how to do this, the idea is take all of them take all of them as your compactification. Of P1 n minus delta n PGL2. Okay. And I would like to make this precise and to show you that this will reproduce the the theory of Delin, Mumford, Knudsen, which is the theory of n-pointed stable curves. So in classical terms, this orbit space was denoted by M0n, which is uh, the terminology due to Mumford, I guess. Okay, M0n, the moduli space of generic n-gons, okay, modulo PGL2. Now, in order to construct the compactification, we are not going to pass directly to stable curves. Instead, we do a trick which is, I think, very beautiful. I learned it from Josef Schicho, so maybe I should write here. Josef Schicho. And only afterwards we realized that implicitly 
it already appears in some of the papers on moduli spaces. And the key concept is what we call symmetrization. And this will give you a construction of the moduli space of the compactification in one step. So what do we do? We take here p1 to the n minus delta n, and we embed this open subset of the Cartesian product of pn into a huge projective space. Namely, we send it to p1 n times n over 3. So the n over 3 refers to triples of numbers. So if you call t i, j, k a triple in 1 up to n. So this corresponds, of course, to the selection of three indices in our n-gons. Then the number of these triples is, of course, n choose 3. Okay. So this is the n choose 3 here. And what we do, we take a generic n gon x1 up to xn. And we send it to something which we call, let me do it here. I need more space. We call it bold physics. And this will be called a string. So this is a string of n gons. And what we do is very simple. We take a triple of numbers, i, j, k. We look at the entries here corresponding to x, i, x, j, x, k. And we move them with the action of PGL2 to our special points 0, 1, and infinity. So let me write this down. So this will be a vector of n-gons, x, t, t triple in n. Let me write this like this, this set here. Numbers from 1 to n. Okay. And xt will be in p1 to the n. And the condition is uh, if t is i, j, k, then we require that xt i is 0, xtj is 1, and xtk is infinity. Okay, So we put these special values at all possible positions in our string. Okay. So of course, each xt will be itself an n-gon. It's a, a long vector if n is huge. But we don't care. Uh, algebraically or conceptually, it's uh, very systematic and clear what we do. So now, as everything is here compatible with the action of PGL2, we get, let me now call this E. If we take now the orbit space here, P1 n minus delta n, mod PGL2, then now that we get an embedding into P1 to the power n, n choose 3. Okay, This is now an embedding. Here, the first map will, of course, will send equivalent n-gons to the same value. But as we factor out by PGL2, this will now be an, an embedding. I call it E, and this is the symmetrization map. Symmetrization map. OK. And now, <clears throat> as this embeds, we are inside a projective variety, and we can just take as our compactification the Zariski closure. So <clears throat> compactification of p1 n minus delta n pgl2 is defined as 
the image of E closure, the risky closure or projective closure in P1, N, N2, 3. Okay. So this, of course, preserves symmetry because we have chosen all triples. So this is a, this is a very almost universal construction, and it is a one-step definition of a projective variety yeah, corresponding to certain types of limits. OK, so let me call this here. Let, it give, let me give it a name, script xn. Okay. So this is the risky closure of this orbit space. And this will contain certain limits. We will define a second subvariety inside here because whenever you pass to the Zariski closure, you know that you will preserve also the cross ratios. So remark, <clears throat> you will realize that if you start here with an n gone and you look at the cross ratio, then the the xt's which appear here, we are, which are many n-gons, as they are all PGL2 equivalent to each other, they will have the same cross ratios. Remark, uh, the n-gons of a string x equals xt will have the same cross ratios trivially by continuity, as we said before. So this gives rise to a second subvariety. Define y n. Now we take the strings. <clears throat> so I have to be a little bit more precise. In z n. P1, N, N2, 3. I will define in a moment what Zn is. Uh, with, the with the equations cross Xt, let me write Q equals cross Q Xs for all triples T S for all. Remember that the cross ratio is defined with respect to four indices i, j, k, l, and I call these quadruples. For all quadruples, Q equals i, j, k, l. And what is Zn? Zn is just the subspace inside here where Uh, T in triple, where you require this condition with star for all T. Okay, that's of course a closed, closed subscheme. Closed. Now, by continuity, clear. Sorry. By continuity, we will have xn inside yn inside zn inside p1 to the n and two three. Okay. You remember, so xn was the risky closure, yn was defined by the equality of cross ratios, and zn you don't have to remember it.
So we have two projective varieties, xn and yn, contained one and the other, corresponding to a certain definition of limit of generic endons. 20 minutes, OK, perfect. So now let me write down the theorem. So this is together with P and Fichu and myself. So the first statement is xn equals yn. So you can have two ways of defining this compactification, either as a Zariski closure or by a number of algebraic equations. And moreover, this is isomorphic to the uh, delin mumford knudsen compactification of M0n. Delin. Mumford Knudsen compactification. compactification of M zero N. So this is what is called the endpoint at stable curves. The elements of this compactification endpoint at stable. So we have equality number two, xn is smooth and irreducible. So the smoothness requires a proof, but it is completely elementary. If you look at Knudsen paper for the smoothness of M0 n bar, you will see that he uses a lot of machinery. The irreducibility is obvious from this equality because yn is, sorry, xn is a Zariski closure of something irreducible, so, the clo so it is automatically irreducible. Okay. Now, <coughs> the, the boundary divisor, 3, if you take xn minus the image of, sorry, the image of this symmetrization is a normal crossings boundary divisor. And moreover, there is a precise control on the components of this divisor. Number four, the forgetful map so let me re recall that xn consists of strings of n gons now if you go to xn plus 1 you have n plus 1 gons so in you have an n gon and then you add one more entry and do you do it in the whole string so if you look at this compactification, you have a natural map going down to xn, forgetting or deleting the entries with index n plus 1. So that's a natural projection map. The Forgetful map Papa 1 is a universal family <clears throat> in the following sense. Uh, for let me write it for M zero N bar. So 
I will be brief here, but at least round for all families. If you take, I need a maybe S, maybe a capital S. No, S is no good. Wait a second. For all W to S family of endpointed. Stable curves. So you know that the, the concept of universal family refers to families of uh, as of orbits. Yeah. So for all morphisms W to S, so the fibers here are endpointed stable curves. There exists a unique S to our X N such that, let me call this F. F is given or isomorphic to the fiber product map. You take S times Xn plus 1, script Xn going down to S. Okay. So that's essentially the definition of universal family. So this corresponds to the notion of fine moduli space, as some of you might know. And uh, number five, which is maybe the most uh, striking one, uh, this forgetful map, it will be defined, I mean, we just used strings to define xn, and uh, we have here the equations using cross ratios. That's completely elementary, elementary and explicit. There is no stable curve appearing here, a priori in the definition of these maps and of these spaces. But if you look at the fibers of pi, the fibers of pi from xn plus 1 to xn are, and in a, in a natural way, which I'm not going to define endpointed stable curves. So you could, without using at any place endpointed stable curves or inventing them, doing this business with the strings and the symmetrization, they pop up in this universal family automatically. Okay. So <clears throat> I have a little bit of time left. So let me now come to phylogenetic trees. The whole thing, the proofs and everything, uses phylogenetic trees. And these are combinatorial objects. Now I think I erase everything because I need the space. So we associate to to n-gons and to strings of n-gons, a graph. And this graph will be a finite graph and a tree. And it will be a phylogenetic tree in the sense that it has no nodes of degree 2. So phylogenetic. So I have to be brief because I'm running out of time, but the, the generic n gone x equals x1 xn will give us the generic string, which will be just x t, t a triple, you, you spread it out, but all entries are pairwise distinct in each n-gon, okay? So, <clears throat> and all these x t will have the same orbit, x t will be equivalent pgl2 to x s for all t s. So we just get one orbit. 
So what we do, we draw this orbit. I hope you can see my blue. It has to dry a little bit, and then no, that's not very good. If we do it in green, is this better? Yeah, OK. And then, as you have n indices, you draw them as leaves. Now I do this in, in red. Excuse me. You draw something like this. And then you number this just by the indices, 1, 2, 3, n minus 1. N, okay, and you get this kind of picture. Now, in the case n equals 4, we have seen that we have, when we go pass to the limit of a generic foregone, we have two orbits. Yeah? So we get, because we get uh, <coughs> xt and xs, which are no longer equivalent to each other, so we get two orbits. appear in a non-generic string. So we, we draw two nodes. And then you remember there were, in the four entries of the foregrounds, there were two were equal and two were distinct. So the distinct ones will be attached here. So these are, again, the leaves. And you connect, you connect the two orbits. So let me do this in red. One, two, three, four. And uh, this node correspond to x, one, two, 3, which was equivalent to x, 1, 2, 4. And this node here corresponds to x, 1, 3, 4, which was equivalent to x, 2, 3, 4. So two orbits, and you connect them. Now, I have to give you the general definition. So a phylogenetic tree, this is a finite graph with no loops, no double edges, no nodes of degree 2, and with n leaves. So the leaves are those which are, have degree 1. So you see here in this picture, the leaves are the red ones, and they are numbered by 1 up to n. And the nodes, which we call the inner nodes, they have at least degree 3, because three edges are going out. Okay. So I will give you a general drawing. How can this look like? So here you have what we call the inner nodes corresponding to orbits. And then you attach as many leaves as you want, maybe at least here you have always two, maybe you have one, maybe you have here two, you have at least two. OK, so that's a typical phylogenetic tree. Now. <clears throat> The, the key point is that to any string, any string x in uh, xn defines a phylogenetic tree. And it goes as follows. So you write x as xt as a vector of n-gons, t a triple, all triples in 1 up to n. So the inner nodes 
are just the orbits, the set of orbits xt. The leaves, so you attach a leaf to an orbit, are attached to xt if and only if xit, so leaves, they are numbered, so let me call them leaves numbered by 1 up to n. So the leaf with number i is attached to xt if xti is a singleton of xt, which means xti is different xtj for all j different i. So it is an entry which is distinct to all other entries. And the interesting part is how you define the edges. So xt and uh, xs are connected by an edge if they share a complementary incidence set. So I have to define this. If xt is an n-gon, I in a subset is an incident set if xti equals xtj for all ij in i, and they are different xtj for all i in i, j in n minus i. So you count the, the indices where entries are equal, and then you connect them if these sets are completely co uh, complementary. So <clears throat> I think I have to finish. So I will just give you the proof of smoothness. The, the proof of smoothness of xn, just to give you an idea how this type of combinatorial objects are used to give the proofs. So the phylogenetic trees are like a dictionary or a manual which tell you how to proceed with the proofs. So for instance, for the proof of smoothness, you delete one edge and the two nodes connecting to it. And in this way, you will get four connected components. So delete one edge, get four connected components. Choose a leaf in each of one, each of it. So you get IJKL. This gives you a quadruple, just the numbers of the leaves of uh, a quadruple, yeah, of, in, of indices. And then you define alpha from your xn to p1 n minus 3. You do this procedure by deleting all possible edges. And you just send x to the vector. <coughs> so this here, let me call it the quadruple associated to e where this e was the edge here. And you just take the cross ratio q 
Qe of all Xt of okay, over all E at of gamma of X, that's the tree. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry I have to stop here. This is just the beginning of the story, but you can imagine that you have now various kinds of operations on these trees. You cut them, you, you clip off leaves, you glue them together, and all this corresponds to algebraic and geometric operations in your moduli space. Yeah? So this is a kind of bookkeeping which will give you all the information about your moduli space. It gives a stratification. It proves smoothness. It gives you back the endpoint as stable curves. So it's a marvelous picture, which is, of course, not, uh, not ours, but which was implicit in these famous works of Dillin, Mumford, and Knudsen. Thank you very much. Arigato.